Section 1 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Old Year Ring out, wild bells, to the wild sky, the flying cloud, the frosty light. The year is dying in the night. Ring out, wild bells, and let him die. Ring out the old, ring in the new, ring happy bells across the snow. The year is going, let him go, ring out the false, ring in the true. Ring out the grief that saps the mind, for those that here we see no more. Ring out the feud of rich and poor, ring in redress to all mankind. Ring out false pride in place and blood, The civic slander and the spite. Ring in the love of truth and right, Ring in the common love of good. Ring out old shapes of foul disease, Ring out the narrowing lust of gold, Ring out the thousand wars of old, Ring in the thousand years of peace ring in the valiant man and free the larger heart the kindlier hand ring out the darkness of the land ring in the christ that is to be alfred tennyson end of section one this recording is in the public domain Section 2 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Phil Schempf. The White-Winged Crossbill, Loxia leucoptera. The crossbills, together with the finches, the sparrows, the grosbeaks, the red poles, the goldfinches, the towhees, the cardinals, the longspurs, and the buntings, belong to that large family of perching birds, called the fringillidae, from the Latin word fringilla, meaning a finch. Mr. Chapman tells us, in his Birds of Eastern North America, that this, the largest family of birds, contains some 550 species which are represented in all parts of the world, except the Australian region. Its members present a wide diversity of form and habit, but generally agree in possessing stout conical bills, which are admirably adapted to crush seeds. They are thus chief among seed-eaters, and for this reason are not so migratory as insect-eating species. Many of the birds, most highly praised for the cage, and as songsters, are representatives of this family, and many of the species are greatly admired for their beautiful coloring. The white-winged crossbill is a native of the northern part of North America, migrating southward into the United States during the winter months. Its technical name, Loxia leucoptera, is most appropriate and descriptive. The generic name, Loxia, is derived from the Greek loxos, meaning crosswise or slanting, and the specific name leucoptera is from two Greek words, meaning white and wing, and has reference to the white tips of the feathers of the wing. The common name crossbill, or as the bird is sometimes called crossbeak, describes the peculiar structure of the bill, which marks them as perhaps the most peculiar of our songbirds. The bill is quite deeply cut at the base, and compressed near the tips of the two parts, which are quite abruptly bent, one upward and the other downward, so that the points cross at an angle of about 45 degrees. This characteristic gives this bird a parrot-like appearance. The similarity is heightened by the fact that these hook-like bills are used by the birds to assist in climbing from branch to branch. The crossbills are even parrot-like in captivity. Dr. Ridgway, in the Ornithology of Illinois, writes as follows regarding the habits of a pair. They were very tame, and were exceedingly interesting little pets. 
their movements in the cage were like those of caged parrots in every respect except that they were far more easy and rapid they clung to the sides and upper wires of the cage with their feet hung down from them and seemed to enjoy the practice of walking with their head downward they were in full song and both the male and female were quite good singers their songs were irregular and varied but sweet and musical they ate almost every kind of food but were especially eager for slices of raw apple although while they lived they were continually bickering over their food yet when the female was accidentally choked by a bit of eggshell her mate was inconsolable ceased to sing refused his food and died of grief in a very few days their peculiar bills are especially fitted for obtaining their food which consists to a great extent of the seeds of cone-bearing trees such as the pine the hemlock and the spruce the ornithologist wilson says on first glancing at the bill of this extraordinary bird one is apt to pronounce it deformed and monstrous but on attentively observing the use to which it is applied by the owner and the dexterity with which he detaches the seeds of the pine tree from the cone and from the husks that enclose them we are obliged to confess on this as on many other occasions where we have judged too hastily of the operations of nature that no other confirmation could have been so excellently adapted to the purpose and that its deviation from the common form instead of being a defect or monstrosity as the celebrated french naturalist insinuates is a striking proof of the wisdom of the great creator as an accidental malformation this structure of the bill has been noted among other birds and it is said with some frequency among the crows a medieval legend gives as the cause for this confirmation of the bill and the red color of the plumage that it was acquired in recognition of the pity it bestowed on the suffering saviour at the crucifixion probably due to the nature of their food which can usually be procured at any season these birds are apparently not under the control of the usual laws that govern migration but wander about in a seemingly aimless manner and are not influenced to any great extent by the changing seasons they do not seem to be a constant inhabitant of any given locality for any length of time but appear and disappear as if constantly dissatisfied with their surroundings the two sexes vary in color the body of the male being a dull carmine red which is brighter on the rump and that of the female is brownish tinged with olive green and with brownish yellow on the rump the young males are similar in color to the females but pass through a changeable plumage while maturing the crossbill usually builds its nest in a cone-bearing tree and does not always choose the most inconspicuous locality the nest is generally constructed of rather coarse twigs and strips of birch or cedar bark and lichens this is lined with hair the softer fibers of bark fine rootlets grass and feathers the whole nest is saucer shaped and about four inches in diameter outside measurement by one and one half in depth authorities tell us that the eggs are usually three in number in color they are a pale blue nearly spotless at the smaller end but at the larger end marked with irregular streaks or dots of lavender or reddish brown the eggs are small about eight tenths of an inch long by nearly six tenths in diameter on account of their vagrant habits dr brehm was wont to call them the gypsies among birds while seeking food or flying from place to place they continually utter a plaintive note and their song is soft and sweet end of section two section three of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen o one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil schempf the legend of the crossbill on the cross the dying saviour heavenward lifts his eyelids calm feels but scarcely feels a trembling in his pierced and bleeding palm and by all the world forsaken sees he how with zealous care at the ruthless nail of iron a little bird is striving there stained with blood and never tiring with its beak it doth not cease 
from the cross twould free the saviour its creator's son release and the saviour speaks in mildness blessed be thou of all the good bear as a token of this moment marks of blood and holy rood and that bird is called the crossbill covered all with blood so clear in the groves of pine it singeth songs like legends strange to hear from the german of julius mosen henry wadsworth longfellow End of section 3。section 4 of birds and nature volume 9 number 1 january 1901 this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the study of bacteria the bacteriologist is working in a wonderland fully as remote to the average mind as that ever occupied by the astronomer or psychologist and yet it is as real to him as though he were walking through a forest and noting the different kinds of trees such popular doubts as have been held regarding bacteriology and even the existence of bacteria are no longer justified the evidence is too overwhelming not to be accepted by anyone who has sufficient interest to investigate the methods used in bacteriologic studies are today giving us information fully as concise as that obtained by the general botanist in the study of higher plants. Indeed, the phenomena of bacterial activities and the chemistry of the products of growth of many species of bacteria have already received attention not equaled in the study of some of our most useful plants. Bacteria are plants, not because of any absolute characteristic that separates them from animals, but because comparative study shows that they are more like plants than animals. They are single-celled organisms, and each individual has the prime factors of life, assimilation, growth, and reproduction. Each bacterium is an independent cell, and although the cells in some species remain attached to one another, giving rise to characteristic groupings, they are mostly detached and free individuals. Bacteria can increase in numbers to a remarkable extent when favorable conditions exist. The mother cell simply splits into two daughter cells, and these form a generation of four cells, while later generations, consisting of perhaps one million cells, can in fifteen or twenty minutes produce two million bacteria. But conditions must be favorable for this active growth. Ample foodstuffs, free from other bacteria, together with moisture and reasonable warmth, are most essential. There are many circumstances constantly at work to prevent an overgrowth of bacteria. Exhaustion of food supply, antagonism of species, and fresh air with sunshine are the most important. Bacteria are present everywhere in greater or less numbers, except within the bodies of healthy, growing plants and animals. It is for this reason that bacteria become so active and multiply with great rapidity when once established in the tissue fluids of larger organisms, either before or after they have died. Vital activities during health prevent the entrance of bacteria into our bodies. There are, however, times when the association of different species of bacteria and also the association of bacteria with higher plants is of mutual advantage. The association of decomposition and pathogenic bacteria frequently makes it possible for the latter to infect an animal when alone it perhaps would not take place. Again, the growth of certain bacteria within the root structure of plants greatly improves their functional activity. The leguminous plants are enabled to assimilate much larger quantities of nitrogen when associated with bacteria than when growing alone. No such mutually advantageous relationships are known to exist between bacteria and animals. The tendencies are rather destructive, leading to the infectious diseases. The general biologic function of the bacteria is very important, and in a general way the need of their existence can be much better appreciated than that of many living beings. Decomposition may be stated as being their chief functional activity. Decomposition stands before life. Without it, the progress of the generations would terminate. The gradual and ever-rapid disappearance of the substance of vegetable and animal bodies after death makes room for growing life. With an absence of decomposition, the bodies of plants and animals would collect on the earth and cover it so deeply with organic matter that plants in particular would be entirely unable to obtain requisite nourishment. Higher plants having chlorophyll are able to feed on inorganic material, while bacteria require organic matter to sustain life. 
bacterial food is then derived from the higher forms of life, while these higher forms feed on the end products of bacterial decomposition, with the addition of salts from the earth. An evolutionary query might then arise as to the early conditions in the history of organic life on the earth. It is certainly a fertile field for the theorist. Accepting the general rule that simplicity of structure indicates priority, what then was the food supply of the primordial bacterium before the advent of higher plants to supply requisite organic matter? We can hardly believe that there was already in existence sufficient ammonia-bearing compounds of suitable quality to sustain these lowest organisms until evolutionary conditions added organisms having the capacity of collecting nitrogen and carbon from purely inorganic sources. These general facts, as we now see them, would apparently strengthen the thought that different kinds of organisms became extant at the same time. The methods used in bacteriologic study are based on a few very distinct principles. Successful cultivation of bacteria depends upon a knowledge of sterilization, preparation of culture media, and isolation of species. It is, in fact, miniature gardening. A rod of platinum wire is the trowel, and this is kept clean and free from undesirable organisms by heating it red-hot in the gas flame. With it, bacteria are lifted from tube or plate. The culture media required are mostly beef tea and gelatin mixtures, and are prepared with extreme care as to their composition and reaction. The decomposition of the culture medium is prevented by keeping it in test tubes or flasks plugged with cotton and sterilized by boiling. By means of the cotton plug, the air passing in and out of the tube is filtered, and the bacteria floating in the air are caught in the cotton and cannot get into the tube. It also prevents bacteria from the culture getting out of the tube and spreading infectious material. Each test tube represents a little greenhouse, but one that is free from all life. It is sterile when ready for use. To the media or culture soils in the tubes, the bacteria are transplanted with the platinum rod, and active growth is obtained by placing the tubes in a suitable temperature. Such a growth of bacteria in a test tube can contain many millions of bacteria, while the resulting appearance of growth is due to the heaping up of the individuals. To the naked eye, the cells are invisible, but the mass is recognized in the same way that one would know a field of wheat in the distance without being able to see each separate plant. Species of bacteria are separated by distributing a few organisms throughout a fluid and then planting upon solid media. The individual cells then grow in place and produce colonies. These are separate and distinct to the eye, and each contains bacteria, all of the same kind. From colonies, transplantation to tube cultures are made, and the species is propagated on different media. The observations from such growths, together with the microscopical study and sometimes inoculation experiments on animals, are the data by which the species is recognized. Microscopic methods, although somewhat complicated, have been so far developed that some species of bacteria can be as promptly recognized under the microscope as an acquaintance met upon the street. Bacteriology is now being studied and investigated as a field of research in hundreds of laboratories and in every university in Europe and America. Bacteriology has added as much to man's wealth and happiness as any of the applied sciences. All the methods of preservation of food depend upon bacteriological principles, while modern sanitary science is based on the recognition of the cause of infectious diseases. The presence of specific bacteria in the secretions or tissues of man and animals is now such a certainty for many diseases that the work of making bacteriologic diagnoses is in itself an extensive vocation. Within the next few years, every city in America will have a diagnosis laboratory for infectious diseases. We can safely predict that the trained bacteriologist will be called upon to stand between each sick person or animal and the community to direct measures that will prevent infection of others. Hygienists are learning more every day as to the exact way in which disease bacteria pass from person to person and the reasons for the occurrence of diseases. They have learned that the accidental and unusual circumstance is least important, but that there is a regular train of cause and effect, and in the knowledge of how to break this chain is the key to the proper control of an epidemic. Veterinary medicine has been able to obtain benefits from bacteriology much beyond those already so important to human medicine. This is so because of the persistent prejudice opposed to bacteriology in medicine, while the veterinarian has been allowed to treat his patients 
practically as the experiment animals are treated in the laboratory. Bacteriologists are frequently meeting demands made of their science that are beyond its present stage of progress. It is frequently forgotten that this is biology whose deductions are always subject to the variation of growing things, and not chemistry or mathematics, with their definite determinations and strict limitations. Bacteriology is now an established science, and it is as competent to render service in due proportion to its development and with the same integrity as any biological subject. There are now many known facts in bacteriology that cannot be made useful because intermediate steps in their study have not been learned. It will require long series of experiments in some cases, but when added to the present usefulness of bacteriology, the results may be expected to satisfy the most severe critics. Adolf Germann End of Section 4section five of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred one recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the yellow-breasted flycatcher come here come here come here my philip dear come here come here philip my dear philip philip my dear poor mournful mrs flycatcher with ample breast of dainty buff now don't you think you've called your mate to say the very least enough i'm sorry for you plaintive one i would be glad to make him fly from his long tearing place to you if that would stop your weary cry can't you decide to give him up all over town you've called his name i heard you calling this week last the week before you called the same perhaps some boy with twenty-two has shot him for his sister's hat go search the churches through and through if he's not there accuse the cat carrie b sanborn end of section five this recording is in the public domain section six of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred one recorded for librivox dot org by betty b the townsend's warbler dendroica townsendi dr robert ridgway in the ornithology of illinois uses the following words in speaking of that family of birds called the american warblers neotilidae no group of birds more deserves the epithet of pretty than warblers tanagers are splendid hummingbirds are refulgent other kinds are brilliant gaudy or magnificent but warblers alone are pretty in the proper and full sense of that term as they are full of nervous activity and are eminently migratory birds they seem to flit rather than fly through the united states as they pass northward in the spring to their breeding places and southward in the fall to their winter homes among the luxuriant forests and plantations of the tropics all the species are purely american and as they fly from one extreme to the other of their migratory range they remain but a few days in any intermediate locality time seems to be an important matter with them it would seem as if every moment of daylight was used in the gathering of food and the night hours in continuing their journey the american warblers include more than one hundred species grouped in about twenty genera of these species nearly three-fourths are represented in north america at least as summer visitants the remaining species frequenting only the tropics the woodland birds they exhibit many and widely separated modes of life some of the species preferring only aquatic regions while others seek drier soils some make their homes in shrubby places while others are seldom found except in forests as their food is practically confined to insects they frequent our lawns and orchards during their migrations when they fly in companies which may include several species mr chapman in his handbook of birds of eastern north america says some species flit actively from branch to branch taking their prey from the more exposed parts of the twigs and leaves others are gleaners and carefully explore the under surfaces of leaves or crevices in the bark while several like flycatchers capture a large part of their food on the wing the townsend's warbler is a native of western north america 
especially near the pacific coast its range extends from sitka on the north to central america on the south where it appears during the winter in its migration it wanders as far east as colorado it breeds from the southern border of the united states northward nesting in regions of cone-bearing trees it is said that the nest of this warbler is usually placed at a considerable height though at times as low as from five to fifteen feet from the ground the nest is built of strips of fibrous bark twigs long grasses and wool compactly woven together this is lined with hair vegetable down and feathers the eggs are described as buffy white speckled and spotted with reddish brown and lilac gray about three-fifths of an inch in length by about one-half of an inch in diameter end of section six this recording is in the public domain section seven of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred and one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by tavarish the story of some black bugs we were going to visit aunt bessie and john and i like few things better than that to begin with she lives in the country and there is always so much to do in the way of fun that the days never seem half long enough then besides aunt bessie knows everything and can tell such famous stories so when she asked us one morning to go to the pond with her and see something interesting you may be sure we were not slow in following her the rushes grew thickly along the sides but the water was clear and we could plainly see the black bugs she pointed out to us crawling slowly and clumsily over the muddy bottom those things said john not a little disgusted i don't think they are much are they tadpoles <laughs> tadpoles i echoed why whoever saw tadpoles with six legs and no tail the absence of a tail is very convincing laughed aunt bessie they are certainly not tadpoles now watch them closely please and tell me all about them they are abominably ugly that is one thing broke in john they look black and have six legs but how funny their skin is more like a crust or lots of crusts laid one on the other they are about the stupidest things i ever saw they seem to do nothing but crawl over that mud and hello they aren't so stupid after all did you see that fellow snatch a poor fly and gobble him up quicker than you could say jack robinson and there's another taking a mosquito just as quick i'll take back what i said about the slow business but really auntie do you think them very interesting i'll ask you that question when you have learned something more about them was her answer tell me now what you think of that dragonfly darting over the water oh he is a beauty we answered in a breath but please let us hear something about those things down there not to-day boys i wish you to see something for yourselves first watch here for a few days and your patience will be rewarded i promise you then i will have a story to tell you i knew that auntie never spoke without reason so john and i kept a close watch on those bugs for two days nothing happened the old things just crawled over the mud or ate flies and mosquitoes as usual but the third day one big fellow decided to try something new it was nothing less than to creep up the stem of one of the rushes i suppose it was hard work for he took a long time to get to the surface of the water 
here he stopped a while and then seemed to make up his mind to go further soon he was quite out of the water and could breathe all the air and sunshine he wished i believe he did not like it very well he seemed so restless and uneasy i was expecting to see him go back when i heard john cry out look oh do look i did look and could scarcely believe my eyes his skin the bugs i mean was actually cracking right down the back just as though the air and sunshine had dried it too much poor fellow he seemed in great trouble about it then to make matters worse a part of his coat broke off at the top and slipped down over his eyes so that he could not see after a moment however it dropped further quite under the place where his chin would have been had he had a chin oh he's getting a new face a prettier one too i am glad to say it seemed as if john was always first to notice things for it was just as he said as the old face slipped away a new one came in its place i guess that by this time that old bug was as much astonished as we were he was wriggling about in a very strange fashion and at last quite wriggled himself out of his old shell then we saw two pairs of wings which must have been folded away in little cases by his side begin to open like fans next he stretched his legs and it was easy to see that they were longer and more beautiful than those he had had before then before we could admire his slender graceful body or fully realize the wonderful change that had occurred to him he darted away before our astonished eyes not a black bug but a beautiful dragonfly hurrah we both shouted the next second we were rushing at top speed to tell auntie all about it just as though she had not known all along what was going to happen she listened and then told us what we did not know how months before the mother dragonfly had dropped the, her tiny eggs in the water where they hatched out the black bugs which were so unlike their mother that she did not know them for her children and had no word to say to them during the long hours she spent in skimming over the water where they lived these bugs were content at first to live in the mud but soon came the longing for sun and air and then followed the wonderful transformation from an ugly black bug to the beautiful dragonfly if you will go beside some pond in the spring or early summer and find among the water grasses such a bug as i have described and will then watch long enough you will see just what john and i saw afterwards i am sure you will agree with us that it is very wonderful indeed louise jameson end of section seven Section 8 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. The Solitary Sandpiper He is a curious little chap, the solitary snipe, and we used to call him Tip-Up. He delights to seesaw and teeter down a clay bank with a tiny peepo, peepo, just before he pokes in his long slender bill for food. He is very tough and possesses as many lives as the proverbial cat i have taken many a shot at him fine sand shot at that and from a gun with a record for scattering and i never succeeded in knocking over but one tip-up while on a hunt for taxidermy specimens i failed to secure even this one 
though he flopped over in the water and floated down upon the surface of the shallows toward where i stood knee-deep awaiting his coming he was as dead as any bird should have been after such a peppering yes he was my prize at last or so i thought as i reached out my hand to lift his limp-looking little body from the water he was only playing possum after all with a whirl of his wings and a shrill peepo peepo he darted away and disappeared upstream and out of sight beyond the alders to add to my disappointment a red-headed woodpecker began to pound out a tantalizing tune upon the limb of a dead hemlock no sand shot could reach that fellow desire him as much as i might then a bold kingfisher with a shrill saucy scream darted down before me grabbed a dace and sailed to a branch opposite to enjoy his feast well knowing the rascal that i had an unloaded gun and had fired my last shell how he knew this i am not able to say but he did wiser fellows in bird lore than i may be able to explain this i cannot the solitary sandpiper is well named he is always at home wherever found and always travels alone be it upon the shelving rock banks of a river or the clay banks of a rural stream he possesses after a fashion the gift of the chameleon and can moderately change the color of his coat or feathers rather when he teeters along a blue clay bank he looks blue and when he seesaws along brown or gray rocks he looks gray or brown as the case may be the city boy who spends his vacation in the rural parts and fishes for dace redfins or sunfish knows the solitary sandpiper to the country boy he is an old acquaintance for he has taken many a shot with stone or stick at the spry little tip-up who never fails to escape scot-free to peepo peepo at his sweet content h s keller end of section eight this recording is in the public domain Section 9 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901, recorded for LibriVox.org by Garth Burton. The Knot or Robin Snipe, Tringa Canatus. The Knot or Robin Snipe is a bird of several names, as it is also called the Red Breasted Ash Coloured Sandpiper, the Greyback and the grey snipe it is quite cosmopolitan breeding in the far north of both hemispheres but in winter migrating southward and wintering in the climate of the southern united states and central america the knot belongs to the snipe family scholar passidae which includes one hundred or more species about forty-five of which are inhabitants of north america nearly all the species breed in the higher latitudes of the northern hemisphere these birds frequent the shores of large bodies of water and are seldom observed far from their vicinity their bills are long and are used in seeking food in the soft mud of the shore the knot visits the great lakes during its migrations and is frequently observed at that time its food which consists of the smaller crustaceans and shells can be as readily obtained on the shores of these lakes as on those of the ocean which it also follows dr ridgway tells us that adult specimens vary individually in the relative extent of the black gray and reddish colors on the upper parts gray usually predominates in the spring the black in midsummer sometimes there is no rufous whatever on the upper surface the cinnamon colour of the lower parts also varies in intensity little is known of the nest and eggs of the knot owing to its retiring habits at the nesting time and the fact that it breeds in the region of the arctic circle so little frequented by man one authentic report that of lieutenant a w greeley describes a single egg that he succeeded in obtaining near fort conger while commanding an expedition to lady franklin sound this egg was a little more than an inch in length and about one inch in diameter 
its colour was a light pea-green closely spotted with brown in small specks about the size of a pinhead end of section nine this recording is in the public domain section ten of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred one recorded for librivox dot org by betty b viola blanda sweet white violet serene the thrush's song all undisturbed its rows of pearls a marvel of completeness then the soft drip of falling tears i heard poor weeping bird who envied so thy sweetness nelly hart woodworth end of section ten this recording is in the public domain Section 11 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Autobiography of a Bird My name is Dewey and no bird was ever prouder of his name i know if admiral dewey could see me he would feel proud of his namesake as i am said to be an unusually handsome intelligent bird i have been laughing in my wings for many months hearing people say what kind of a bird i am some say i am an aureole some a male others a female another a meadowlark another not a meadow-lark but some kind of lark one thing they agree upon that i go on a lark from early morn till dewy eve i am said to have a little of the blue jay and points like dozens of birds when i was about six weeks old i was quite large and fluffy but very much of a baby for i knew nothing about feeding myself my tail was long olive on top yellow underneath wings black with cream color on the edges on the lower feathers just a line on the upper ones quite a little wider at the top short yellow feathers making lovely little scallops head and black olive brown rump more on the yellow throat and breast light yellow with a change of blue under the wings and belly only tinted as i grew older i kept changing and now at nine months old my breast is light orange belly light yellow head and back deeper olive rump deeper yellow i broke my tail all off in the fall and when it came in the upper feathers were black with yellow a quarter of an inch at the rump under ones yellow and black on my head are almost invisible stripes of black on my neck pretty broken wavy ones my eyes are large and bright my bill everyone says is the handsomest they have ever seen very long and pointed as a needle underneath ivory white on top black with a white star at the head the admiration of all are my legs and claws as i keep them so clean and they are beautiful blue just the shade of malachite i am seven inches long and for the last month have been getting black spots over my eyes and on my throat now what kind of a bird am i one june afternoon i thought i was old enough to take a walk by myself so off i started without asking permission of my father or mother all went well for a while, and I was having a delightful time seeing many new strange things. Then all at once I began to feel very tired and hungry, and thought I would go home, but which way to go I knew not. I went this way and that, and peeped as loud as ever I could, calling mother, mother, but no answer came. Finally I sat down, tucked my head under my wing and went to sleep the next thing i knew something was coming down over me and i was held very tight 
i screamed pecked and tried my best to get away then someone said very gently don't be afraid little birdie i am not going to harm you but send you to a lady who loves little birds and will take good care of you i was dreadfully frightened but i did not make another peep we went a long way then i heard the little boy say charlotte will you please take this bird to miss bascom for she was so kind to me when i was sick i changed hands and off we went soon i heard someone calling out there comes charlotte with a bird then another voice said i wonder if it is another sparrow but when she saw me she exclaimed what a perfect beauty took me in her hand and i knew at once i had found a good friend and new mother bread and milk were ordered of course i did not know what bread and milk were but i was so hungry i could have swallowed dirt or stones so there was no trouble about my taking it and i wished all birds could have such delicious food i was taken upstairs to my new home where everything was in pink and green and looked so fresh i thought i was back in the clover field my new mother for that is what i mean to call her took me up to what she called a cage and said trixy and servera i want to introduce you to your new brother trixy charmed me at once for he was like a ray of sunshine in his dress of gold but when i looked at servera i laughed right out in his face it was very rude but i know if any of you had been in my place you would have done the same thing of all the ugly specimens of a bird i had ever seen he was the very worst he was trixie's size but only had his baby feathers and one tail feather he was dirt color had big staring eyes and such a bill almost as large as his head which was perfectly flat he looked so common and ill-bred that i wondered how dainty trixie ever sat beside him i was too sleepy to ask any questions and was soon fast asleep on my new mother's finger then was put into a nice little basket filled with cotton the next day trixie was very kind to me but cervera was cross and pecked me every time he got a chance trixie said i have tried to be kind to that old spaniard cervera but i do not like him and will not have him snuggle close to me nights so i fight him until he gets into the swing if you will sleep in your cage you may put your wings close to mine for you are so pretty and clean when bedtime came my new mother said i was too large for the basket and i might try sleeping in the cage so she put me in and made Cervera get up into the swing. Just as Trixie and I were going to sleep, Cervera began swinging with all his might and would reach down, peck us on the head and pull our feathers out. When he was caught, he was taken out and made to sleep in the basket. In the morning we were all let out on the floor and it was amusing to see Cervera mimic everything Trixie did. If Trixie took a drink, Cervera did, and would follow everywhere he went. About that time I saw coming into the room a large striped thing with shining green eyes and my heart beat so fast I could hardly breathe. Trixie whispered in my ear, you need not be at all afraid that is only taffy the cat and we are the best of friends taffy jumped into my new mother's lap and we three stood on the table and ate bread and milk together the first time i was left in the room alone i looked around to see what would be nice to play with first i went over to the dressing table carried two large cuff buttons and put them into my drinking cup Another pair I put on the floor of the cage with two large coral hairpins, 
two shell pins and some studs i stuck all the pins on anything i could pick up and threw them on the floor turned over a basket which was filled with ribbon and lace some i left on the floor and with the rest i trimmed the cage when i heard my new mother coming i began to tremble she stood speechless for a moment then said you rogue of a bird how shall i punish you then took me in her hand and kissed me and i knew the future was clear and i could have all the fun i wanted Trixie had the asthma very bad, and sometimes a little whiskey on some sugar would relieve him. It was funny to see that bad Cervera maneuver to get Trixie off the perch so he could eat the sugar and whiskey. Trixie grew worse instead of better, and one morning my new mother was wakened early by his hard breathing. She took him off from his perch and found his claws ice cold and he was so weak he could hardly hold on he lay in her hand a moment then threw back his pretty head and all was over we were all heartbroken and shed many tears for we were powerless to bring back to life that little bird we loved so dearly i really felt sorry for that horrid cervera he missed trixie and for days seemed to be looking for him one evening he went out the window and we never saw him again i am very fond of sweet apples and generally whenever i want anything that is downstairs i go and get it i love grapes better than any other fruit when i want one i hop back and forth on the back parlor table then on top of a high back chair and tease until one is given to me I like best to have my new mother hold a grape in her right hand, while I perch on her left and suck all the rich, sweet juice next the skin out first. Then I take the grape over on the table on a paper and knock it until all the seeds come out before I eat it. I like bananas, too, and go to the fruit dish and open one myself. Every morning I perch on the plate of finger bowl and eat my orange we usually have our orange in our room and sometimes i get so impatient i fly over to the bed back to the orange and beg my new mother to get up i always take a drink out of the finger bowl and often said to myself what a fine bathtub this would make when fall came i began going to bed at five o'clock and at seven was awakened and taken out to dessert. One night I became tired of waiting and went out into the dining room very quietly, and the first thing I spied was a finger bowl, so thought that was just the time for a bath. In I went. They heard the splashing and looked up to see everything as well as myself soaking wet. Off! course they thought it was cunning but after i did it for three nights i was told two baths a day were too much for me i made up my mind if i could not take a bath in the finger bowl at night i would in the morning and as i refused to go near my old bathtub the bowl was given me for my own there was a bowl of wandering jew on the dining table and several times i took a bath in the center all said i made a beautiful picture but when they found i was tearing the vine all to pieces it was not so pretty and many lectures were given to me but i heeded them not and if taken away i would walk for i can walk as well as hop all over the table on the ends of my toes and look every way but towards the ball then when no one was looking grab a piece and take it up on top of a picture one day i trimmed all of the pictures and there was none left in the ball so i had to look up some other mischief when i go out to dinner I have my own little tablecloth and plate put on my new mother's. I usually take a little of everything. Chicken and cranberry jelly is very good. 
sometimes i do not behave very well for i go tiptoeing across the table to my grandmother's plate hop on the edge and see if she has anything i like when dinner was ready to be served i went over on the sideboard made holes in all the butter bowls then took some mashed potato and boiled onion and put them to cool in a big hole i had made in an apple few people know that birds are ever sick at their stomachs i had been in the habit of eating a little shaved hickory nut that was put in a half shell and kept in a dish on the back parlor table when i came downstairs i usually took a taste and it seemed to agree with me for a chance i ate a little chestnut and soon began to feel bad so went off by myself and tried to go to sleep when my new mother saw me she said she knew i was not well for i never acted that way in the daytime she put me in my cage and sat down beside me i would close my eyes and open my bill and she thought i was dying until i opened my bill very wide and out came the chestnut in a lump a half inch long and a quarter wide my mother's writing desk is a favorite place of mine i get into drawers pigeonholes and ink pictures and all sort of small things i throw on the floor once i stole ever so many dimes and pennies i can lift a silver dollar and often carry a coffee spoon all about the room so you see i have a very strong bill if anything is lost all say dewey must have taken it one day my new mother looked until she was tired for her thimble when she asked me for it i pretended i did not hear but as she was going into the dining-room i dropped it down on her head from the top of the portiere i often perch on a basket on top of the bookcase in the writing-room when i saw a new white veil beside me i went to work and made ten of the prettiest eyelet holes you can imagine right in front some were round and some star-shaped as i grew older i said i will not sleep in my cage for a few nights i insisted upon sleeping on the brass rod at the head of the bed then changed to the top of the curtain i have a piece of soft flannel over some cotton put on the ledge and on the wall so i will not take cold if it is very cold i get behind the frill of the curtain so no one can see me if warm i turn around so my tail hangs over the outside when my new mother comes in i open my eyes make a bow and if not too sleepy come down and sit on her hand i never chirp or peep and when i hide and hear dewey dewey i do not answer but fly down on my new mother's head shoulder or hand taffy gets so angry at me i know he often feels like killing me i wake up early mornings and take my exercise by flying back and forth from a picture on one side of the room to the head of the bed when taffy is on the foot of the bed i fly very low almost touching him with my wings and say you lazy cat why don't you wake up and hear the little birds sing to god almighty why don't you wake up i soon hear words that are not used in polite society and next see the end of his tail disappearing around the corner of the door before i go to sleep at night i exercise again one afternoon taffy was trying to take a nap in a chair in the back parlor i kept flying over him making a whizzing sound with my wings when he could endure it no longer he went into the writing room and sat down by his mother i went in to take a luncheon on the table taffy stood up on his hind legs reached out a velvet paw and gave me such a slap i fell upon the floor I was not hurt in the least, flew up on a picture and shook with laughter at the punishment and scalding Mr. Taffy was getting. He said very naughty words, scratched and bit, but 
he was conquered at last and has behaved like a gentleman ever since the first time i saw the snow i was wild with delight flew to the window and tried to catch the pretty white flakes but when i heard the sleigh bells they struck terror in my heart for i thought the whole army of cats was coming as all i knew about bells are taffies not long ago my new mother was very ill and had to send for a strange physician who knew nothing about me when i heard him coming upstairs i hid behind the curtain and watched him fix a white powder in a paper when he laid it on the table i swooped down grabbed it and took it into my cage after that i was kept busy as my grandmother was ill for many weeks i would carry off all the sleeping powders one day i put them behind the bed for i thought they would not taste so badly and do just as much good it did not take more than a minute to get down there when i heard the doctor come in for i had to see that the medicine was mixed all right it was great fun peering into the tiny bottles in his case i would stand on the ends of my toes and crane my neck to watch him drop the medicine into the tumblers the other day some christmas roses were brought in they looked so tempting i took several bites and the next day took some more i felt a little queer and kept opening my bill my new mother thought i had something in my throat and gave me some water the next afternoon she found me on the floor panting took me to an open window gave me wine and the attack seemed to pass we went up to our room and apparently i was as well as ever when she went down to dinner after she had gone another attack came on and i am too weak to write any more and can only warn little birds never to taste of a christmas rose as they are said to be deadly poison when i went to my room late in the evening no little birdie peeped over the curtain to greet me i looked on the floor and there lay my darling dewey stiff and cold caroline crowning shield bascom end of section eleven section twelve of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen o one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by phil Schempf. the american hawk owl cernia uula caparock the typical form of this owl cernia uula is a native of scandinavia and northern russia and incidentally is a visitor to western alaska we are told by mr l m turner who was stationed by the united states signal service in alaska from eighteen seventy four to eighteen eighty one that the natives assert that this form is a resident and breeds in the vicinity of st michael's also that it is a coast bird i e not going far into the interior and that it can live a long time in the winter without food as it remains for days in the protection of the holes about the tangled roots of the willow and alder patches its true breeding range however is the northern portion of the eastern hemisphere it is somewhat larger and lighter in color than the american hawk owl the bird of our illustration the american hawk owl is simply a geographical variety of the old world form and is a native of northern north america from alaska to newfoundland this is its usual breeding range though it migrates in winter to the northern border of the united states and is an occasional visitor during severe winters as far south as maine and idaho it is much more common in the northern portion of its range unlike the other owls as we usually understand their habits it may be considered as strictly diurnal seeking its prey to a great extent at least during daylight usually during the early morning or evening hours its principal food consists of the various species of rodents insects and small birds its southward migration is caused by that of its food species especially that of the lemmings it is a tame bird and may be said to know no fear 
we are told by dr a k fisher that specimens have been known to return to the same perch after being shot at two or three times it is a courageous bird and will defend its nest against all intruders a male once dashed at dr dahl and knocked off his hat as he was climbing to the nest other similar accounts show that the courage displayed on this occasion was not an individual freak but a common trait of the species not alone in its diurnal habits is it like the hawks but it also resembles some of them in selecting the dead branch of a tall tree in some sightly locality from which to watch for its prey from this position it will swoop down hawk-like like the hawks its flight is swift and yet noiseless a characteristic which is common to all the owls as a rule its note which is a sharp shrill cry is only sounded when flying as a nesting site hollow trees are more frequently chosen however nests built of twigs and lined with grass are not infrequent these are usually placed on the tops of stumps or among the branches of dense cone-bearing trees the number of eggs varies from three to seven and are frequently laid long before the ice and snow have disappeared the eggs vary from oval to oblong oval in shape are pure white in color and somewhat glossy the shell is smooth and fine-grained incubation begins as soon as the first egg is laid and both sexes participate in this duty and occasionally both are found on the nest at the same time at the nesting season the courage of both sexes is very marked the male will fight with its talons and even when wounded will still defend itself we are told by mr gentry that calmly and silently it maintains its ground or springs from a short distance on its foe so bravely it dies without thought of glory and without a chance of fame for of its kind there are no cowards this bird like other species of owls though possibly not to so great an extent because of its diurnal habits is looked upon by the indian tribes as a bird of ill omen and by some tribes all owls are called death birds as a whole the hawk owls are perhaps more useful to man than any other birds that are not used as food they cause but little trouble in the poultry yard and are of incalculable value to the farmer because of the large number of small rodents that they destroy end of section twelve Section 13 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Phil Schempf. A Bird Calendar by the Poets. January. This is not the month of singing birds. Silently overhead the hen hawk sails with watchful measuring eye, and for his quarry waits. Lowell. February sometimes a flock of strange birds descends upon us from the north the crossbills there is an old tradition that the red upon their breast was caused by the blood of our saviour as they sought to free him with their bills from the cross and that bird is called the crossbill covered all with blood so dear in the groves of pine it singeth songs like legends strange to hear longfellow march no birds are more closely associated with early spring than the swallows gallant and gay in their doublets gray all at a flash like the darting of flame chattering arabic african indian certain of springtime the swallows came doublets of gray silk and surcoats of purple ruffs of russet round each little throat wearing such garb they had crossed the waters mariners sailing with never a boat sir edwin arnold april winged lute that we call a bluebird you blend in a silver strain the sound of the laughing waters the sound of spring's sweet rain the voice of the wind the sunshine and fragrance of blossoming things ah you are a poem of april that god endowed with wings may this is the month of the bobolinks merrily merrily there they hie now they rise and now they fly they cross and turn and in and out and down the middle and wheel about with few shoo waddle lincoln listen to me bob o lincoln 
happy's the wooing that's speedily doing that's merry and over with bloom of the clover bob lincoln waddle lincoln winter sea bee follow me june then sings the robin who wears a sunset memory on his breast pouring his vesper hymns and prayers to the red shrine of the west july the full tide of song is on the ebb but you still hear in the shadowy woods the silvery notes of the wise thrush who sings his song twice over lest you should think he never could recapture that first fine careless rapture browning august the hummingbird when the mild gold stars flower out as the summer gloaming goes a dim shape quivers about some sweet rich heart of a rose then you by thoughts of it stirred still dreamily question them is it a gem half bird or is it a bird half gem edward fawcett september there is something wistful in the notes of the birds preparing to depart in the woods we see a little bird in suit of sombre olive soft and brown with greenish gold its vest is fringed its tiny cap is ebon tinged with ivory pale its wings are barred and its dark eyes are tender starred dear bird i said what is thy name and thrice the mournful answer came so faint and far and yet so near pee-wee 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 trowbridge october this brown month surely belongs to the sparrows close beside my garden gate hops the sparrow light sedate there he seems to peek and peer and to twitter too and tilt the bare branches in between with a fond familiar mien lathrop november in cold weather the little gray chickadee cheers us with his tiny voice gay and polite a cheerful cry chick chickadee dee saucy note out of a sound heart and merry throat this scrap of valor just for play fronts the north wind with waistcoat gray emerson december the sleep of the earth has begun under the white thick snow the owl is abroad by night a flitting shape of fluffy down in the shadow of the woods to wit to woo i wish i knew tell me the riddle i beg whether the egg was before the owl or the owl before the egg arranged by ella f mosby end of section 13 this recording is in the public domain section 14 of birds and nature volume 9 number 1 january 1901 recorded for librivox.org by tavarish so when the night falls and the dogs do howl sing ho for the reign of the horned owl we know not alway who are kings by day but the king of the night is the bold brown owl barry cornwall end of section fourteen this recording is in the public domain Section 15 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tavarish. The Oyster and its Relatives Of all the grand divisions of the animal kingdom, the sub-kingdom Mollusca is probably the least known to the ordinary observer and if one were asked to enumerate as many different kinds of shellfish as he could it is probable that not over six or eight different varieties would be named the majority of people think of a clam oyster mussel snail or nautilus and their molluscan vocabulary ends with these names and yet this group of animals is second only to the insects in number of different species, beauty of coloration, and interest of habitat. They may be found everywhere, 
in salt and fresh water in our forests and fields our ponds brooks and rivers in the valleys and on the mountain tops and even in the waters of the frozen north while in the warm waters of the tropics they flourish in uncounted millions in size they range from the little sea snails hidden in the eel grass along the shore with tiny shells scarcely an eighth of an inch in length to the giant squid which measures forty feet or more from the tip of its tail to the end of its long arms and they range from the tide-washed beach to the abyssal depths of the ocean it is to these lowly creatures that i would draw the reader's attention in nearly all the species of the mollusca the animal is protected by a hard shell made of carbonate of lime which is covered with a horny epidermis to protect the limey shell from being dissolved by the acids in the water this shell is generally capable of containing the entire animal thus affording in most cases adequate protection for the soft body those animals not provided with a shell as is the case with the land slugs are capable of covering themselves with a sort of mucus which insists and protects them from both extreme heat and cold the lowest branch of mollusca is known as class pelecipoda which comprises all of the different kinds of clams mussels quahogs etc in which the body is protected by two hard calcareous shells placed generally opposite each other and connected on the upper margin by a ligament and the two valves work back and forth in teeth and sockets making a kind of hinge a set of stout adductor muscles keep the two shells or valves together and allow them to open and close at the will of the animal the majority of clams live in the mud in a horizontal position the anterior end being buried and the posterior end containing the siphons which draw in and expel the water being out of the mud in the water the clam progresses by pushing forward its strong muscular foot getting a firm hold of the mud and then drawing the shell after it some pelecipods as the oyster live attached to some object on the bottom of the water as a stone piece of wood or piling of an old wharf and are not able to travel from place to place as are the true clams examples of the latter being freshwater mussels and the marine quahog or round clam some bivalves also attach themselves by abysses composed of a number of silk-like threads which anchor their shells to stones sticks and other foreign objects in one group genus pinna found in the mediterranean sea this byssus is so fine and silky that the italians weave it with silk and make caps gloves and other articles of wearing apparel another wonderful and interesting arrangement for the comfort of the animal is its breathing organs or branchiae these are two or four in number and are made up of numerous small chambers covered with little whip-like organs or cilia which keep up a constant motion creating currents of water bring thousands of minute organisms to the clam to serve as food these little organisms many of them microscopic are caught upon the surfaces of the gills rolled into little masses and passed into the animal's mouth besides being food gatherers the gills serve to keep up a circulation by which fresh water is constantly brought in to purify and aerate the blood and also to expel the waste products there is no head in this class and the mouth is an oval slit surrounded by four lips or palpi and leads almost directly into the stomach the currents of water spoken of above are controlled and directed in several different ways in attached forms and those living above the surface of the mud like the oyster mussel and scallop 
the soft mantle which lines the shell is divided forming a slit nearly the whole diameter of the shell and the water is allowed to circulate freely through the open edges of the shells but in those animals which burrow in the mud as the common little neck clam freshwater clam and quahog this mantle is closed and prolonged posteriorly into one double or two single siphons or tubes one being fringed with little finger-like cilia and drawing in the water by their motion and the other expelling the water after it has circulated through the animal one of the most attractive families of bivalve shells is the veneridae or venous shells in which the shelly skeleton is ornamented by many bright colors the patterns occurring in spots dashes zigzag lines and rays some varieties as the spiny venus cytheria lupinaria have the posterior end of the shell provided with long sharp curved spines and the shell is also frilled in a beautiful manner the common quahog round or hard-shelled clam which is esteemed an article of diet on the atlantic coast and also to some extent in the interior is a prominent member of this family the veneridae comprise some five hundred species found throughout the world and ranging from the shore between tides to several hundred fathoms in depth the family cardiidae the hard shells or cockles comprise some of the largest and most attractive of mollusks the name cardium signifying a heart is given them because of the close resemblance to that organ when a shell is viewed from the anterior end these animals live in sandy or muddy bays and generally congregate by thousands in england the edible cockle cardium edule is considered quite a delicacy and thousands are used for this purpose in our own country they are not generally eaten except by the poor in florida and in some places along the gulf of mexico but the waters of florida furnish some very handsome species among them the cardium isocardia figured on our plate and the large cardium magnum which grows to a length of five inches and whose shell is ornamented by beautiful color patterns of brown and yellow the foot of the cardium is very peculiar being shaped like a sickle which enables the animal to pull itself along at a lively gait a california cockle leocardium elatum grows to a diameter of seven inches and would furnish a meal for several people in the family tridacuidae size seems to have reached its limit tridacena gigas found in the indian ocean grows to a length of nearly six feet and weighs upward of eight hundred pounds tryon records that a pair of these shells weighing five hundred pounds and two feet in diameter are used as benetiers in the church of saint sulpice paris in some parts of the indian ocean where pearl and sponge fishing are carried on this clam known as the giant clam is a source of great danger to the divers many losing their lives by being caught between the great valves of the shell by either hands or feet many times a diver has amputated his fingers hand or foot and thus saved his life at the expense of one or more of these members the telinas family telinidae number among its five hundred or more species some very beautiful and interesting animals they live for the most part buried in sand or sandy mud and are found throughout the entire world our common telina radiata familiarly called sunshell is found in florida and the west indies and a typical valve looks not unlike the horizon at sunrise the brilliant rays of color spreading in different directions from a common center at newport rhode island the writer has gathered many thousand specimens of a beautiful little telen telina tenera whose shell measures scarcely half an inch in diameter and is tinted a lovely pink or pinkish white 
the siphons of this family are very long and are separated the upper one being half or three quarters as long as the lower one and the foot is rather long and pointed admirably adapted for burrowing the long siphons enable the animal to bury itself to quite a depth beneath the surface of the sand closely related to the tellinidae is the psamobidae a characteristic form of which psamobia rubroradiata is thus spoken of by professor josiah keep in his interesting little book west coast shells Quote, but i wanted to see more of him so i took a large jar filled it half full of beach sand added as much seawater as it would hold and plunged my prize into the same he rested quietly for a few minutes and then began to open his shell and cautiously put out his two siphons soon afterward from between the edges of his shells came his big white spade-shaped foot he drove it down into the sand curved it a little to one side gave a vigorous pull and lo his shell followed though just why i could not clearly understand though the jar was large he reached the bottom before his shell was wholly covered with sand and had to content himself with a half above ground tenement next morning his siphons were stretched out some six inches in length i never thought before that there was any particular beauty to the siphons of a clam but for this red-lined one my opinions quickly changed imagine two tubes made of the finest pink and white silk stretched over delicate hoops arranged at regular intervals then think of them as endowed with life and waving with a graceful motion through the water and you will have a faint idea of their exquisite texture and elegant appearance End quote. To those readers who live in the west, away from the ocean, the unio, or freshwater mussel, is more or less familiar. What child in Chicago has not played on the sands of Lake Michigan and scooped up the little grains with the broken half of a clam shell? Or who, wading in the muddy water of Lake Calumet, has not wondered what the curious little hollow fringed objects were which protruded from the surface of the mud these latter were the siphons of the clam and if you were to dig under them a little way you would find the beautiful green rayed shell of a river mussel these are no less interesting than the marine shells already described and in beauty of ornamentation they frequently excel many of their salt-water relatives such excrescences as knobs spines and rib-like undulations are common while the colors of the interior range from pure silvery white through orange pink and salmon to dark purple and the rich pearly iridescence rivals that of any of the marine shells in many parts of the west mussels are collected by men in search of pearls which are generally of an inferior quality and thousands of shells are used annually in the manufacture of pearl buttons one of the most familiar objects to the seaside visitor is the huge banks of sea mussels mitilus which line the shore at low water the shells are generally dark colored our common mussel mitilus edilus being frequently jet black and are more or less wedge shaped in form they attach themselves to mud banks and shore vegetation by a strong byssus made up of stout more or less silky threads the mussels are of great value economically thousands of bushels of the edible mussel mitilus edilus being consumed annually in europe they are also used as bait and millions of the mussels are thus used every year although considered a delicacy in parts of great britain and europe it has not yet been adopted as an article of diet in this country the clam and quahog taking its place 
The family Aviculidae, comprising the wing shells or pearl oysters, is of great interest both scientifically and economically. At the present time, there are a little over 100 species living, but the family has been known from early geological times and over a thousand species have been found in the rocks. The pearl oyster, Meleagrina margaritifera, is the most important member of this family, furnishing as it does the beautiful pearls of commerce. These animals are found at Madagascar, Ceylon, and other parts of the Indian Ocean, several hundred tons being imported into Europe annually. These pearls are formed by some irritating substance as a grain of sand or some parasite getting in between the shell and the animal, or lodging in some soft part, which causes the animal to cover it with pearly matter to prevent irritation. The shells also furnish a considerable part of the mother of pearl, which is so largely used for ornamental purposes. The Margaritifera radiata, figured on our plate, is a member of this family. The scallop is an object well known to the tourist visiting New England summer resorts who has reveled in fried scallops. The family to which this belongs Pectinidae, is composed of rounded shells, many with frills or ribs, and nearly all ornamented with beautiful colors. Unlike the animals which we have been considering, these mollusks have no siphons, and the shell is open all the way around, save at the hinge, and the edge of the mantle is provided with little round black eyes. It is an interesting sight to observe a beach at low water, the receding tide having left on the shore or in little pools of water hundreds of these mollusks attached by abysses to bits of seaweed. As one is gazing wonderingly over this vast field of yellow sand and green weed, an object will suddenly move through a pool of water with astonishing rapidity, accompanying the movement by a quick snapping sound. This is the scallop, which is imprisoned in the pool and which desires to get out. The movement is effected by rapidly closing and opening the two valves of the shell, thereby causing a clicking sound. The noise of several hundred of these shells opening and closing, and the sight of as many scallops with strings of seaweed attached to them, shooting through the water, looking not unlike a comet with a long tail, is quite bewildering. In Europe the scallop is considered quite a delicacy, and several tons are gathered annually. One species, Pecten jacobaeus, has been dignified as a badge of several orders of knighthood, and it was also worn by pilgrims to the Holy Land a good many years ago. It was called St. James Shell. The most common shell to the layman is the oyster, Ostrea virginica, the cultivation of which occupies the attention of a large number of men and the investment of considerable capital. The oyster is free and active when young, but becomes attached to some submerged object early in life. Oyster culturists take advantage of this habit by erecting poles in the water to which the young oysters attach themselves. The shells of the different species of oyster are not generally of much beauty, but a related family, the spondylidae, or spiny oysters, are among the most beautiful of bivalves. In this family the shell is ornamented by many long spines and frills, and the colors are different shades of red, yellow, and pink. The most beautiful species are found in the Gulf of California. The space at our command is far too limited to adequately discuss the many curious and interesting animals which make up the class Pelicipoda. Much might be said of the solen or razor shell, with its curious foot, which is so great a help in digging burrows. Of the folads, which perforate and make burrows in clay, wood, and even in the hardest rock, 
and of the strange teredo or shipworm with a long worm-like body which bores into ships wharves and any wooden object within reach but enough has been written and pictured to show the reader that the unpretentious clam mussel or oyster and their relatives have many interesting habits are encased in beautiful shells and that some species are of great economic importance to man frank collins baker end of section 15Section 16 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. The Passing of Summer Where have the charms of summer gone? Part of its sunny, azure skies, The bluebirds southward bore away, And how could sunset splendors stay, O glory of the early dawn, when not a tanager now vies with orange flaming orioles, and humming birds no magic bowls of nectar drain in gardens fair, or flash like jewels through the air. Where have the summer's beauties flown? Afar on swallows' purple wings with blackbirds' iridescent throats, and with the thrushes' perfect notes of rapture into music grown, with blue the indigo bunting brings a sapphire set with emerald leaves, and finch gold that June interweaves with silver from the kingbird's breast, and studs with pearls of many a nest. When will the summer come again? When olive warblers northward fly, And to their hints of budding green, The grosbeaks add a rosy sheen Of warming skies. Oh, not till then will summer come And winter die. Benjamin Carr End of section 16. This recording is in the public domain. Section 17 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by David Lawrence, June 2017, in Wasega Beach, Ontario. The Collared Lizard, Crotophytus cholerus. The collared or ring-neck lizard may be found among the rocks and open woods of the plateau or in desert regions from southern Missouri southward into Mexico westward to southeastern california and northward to southern idaho however this is its general range and it is not common over all this territory though it has been known to ascend to an altitude of nearly six thousand feet yet it does not seem to have crossed the sierra nevada range as it has not been observed at any point on the pacific coast or the interior of california the collared lizard is so called because of the black bars which resemble a collar and are situated between the forelegs and extend across the back of the animal they vary greatly in color depending on their age or geographical position the back is usually some shade of dull or rather dark green or it may have a bluish cast with numerous oblong or rounded lighter spots which may be either whitish or various shades of red, orange, or yellow. These spots may be quite definite, or they may form quite continuous bands. The variations in color are much more marked in the young. Dr. Cope tells us that it runs very swiftly, carrying the tail over its back. In its manners, 
it is perhaps the most pugnacious of our lizards opening its mouth when cornered and biting savagely its sharp teeth can do no more than slightly cut the skin mr frank m woodruff relates the following interesting account of his experiences with this lizard i found the collared lizard at three points in missouri vineland de soto and pilot knob they are restricted to the rocky glades where they live with the scorpions and the rattlesnakes the only place where i found them abundant was between vineland and the old kingston mines during the hot summer months they make their appearance upon the broad slabs of rock often quite a distance from their lairs when disturbed they make a dash to escape and usually in the direction that leads to their accustomed crevices even though the intruder is in its path i have had them run almost across my feet in their frantic efforts to hide they are a somewhat terrifying object as they run toward you at this time they apparently assume a partly upright position looking for all the world like a small edition of mephistopheles the negroes are mortally afraid of them they call them glade devils and the more superstitious believe that the souls of the very bad negroes reside in them a negro will never go through a glade frequented by this species and will make a long detour to avoid doing so the only time i ever saw a negro turn gray was when i brought one of these lizards to ironton and asked for assistance in capturing it when it escaped they are so swift in their movements that i found the best method of capturing them was by tying a noose of fine copper wire to a fish pole this can be slipped over their heads as they lie sunning themselves as they seem to pay little attention to the loop as it touches them by exercising caution it is possible to approach from the rear to within eight or ten feet without exciting them they make delightful pets if a lizard can be considered such by feeding them through the winter on mealworms and in the summer on flies and grasshoppers they can be kept for a year or more end of section seventeen Section 18 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901, recorded for LibriVox.org by Betty B. A Night in the Flower Garden, A Fairy Story The day had passed and the sun had gone to sleep in a bed of crimson and gold. The wind blew softly, at which the leaves on the great trees in the garden began to murmur. Though it was evening, they were not sleepy, like some of the flowers who thought it time to go to sleep when the sun did sometimes the leaves were awake all night you could hear them moving gently in the breeze the clover leaves were folded close in sleep long ago and the poppies declared they could not sit up a moment longer but the tall white lilies who loved the night were wide awake they could not sleep when the garden was full of moonlight they said the crickets were so noisy and the katydid so quarrelsome that it disturbed them so they stood fair and white gathering the dew in their silvery cups which filled the soft night air with sweet perfume the roses were looking pale and sad in the moonlight they reveled in the golden sunshine and grew brilliant in the heat of day but they were languid now and sometimes a little breeze would send their velvet petals floating to the ground to fade and die the pansies nestled low with closed eyes you would have not have known where the mignonette and heliotrope were had you not breathed their sweet perfume for they were fast asleep the nasturtiums hollyhocks and marigolds were still as bright and gay as if the sun whom they loved could see them and they felt like sitting up with the four o'clocks and evening primroses who never went to sleep until very late but of all the flowers in the garden the sweet peas were the widest awake there they stood in rows dainty and fair never thinking of going to sleep but trembling with excitement you could see them whispering together for they had heard that to-night the fairy queen was to come to the garden and would give a soul to some flower which one they did not know but hoped it would be to them a little hummingbird had brought the news and had told it only to the sweet peas so they thought it must be for them that this beautiful change was to come 
had they not heard that years ago a sweet flower called narcissus had been changed into a beautiful youth who could wander where he wished what delight that would be and had they not also heard of pansies changing into little children and larkspurs into larks that soared away into the bright blue sky of water lilies changing into maidens who made their homes under the green waves and they had always thought that myriads of brilliant flowers were changed into the daintiest of all things the little hummingbirds must have been flowers at one time for they were always hovering around them kissing them and making love to them oh if the fairy queen would only change them into birds or velvet bees or better still into the beautiful butterflies that came to them so often and fluttered like a cloud around them yes they would rather be butterflies than anything else slowly the moonlight faded from the flowers the shadows of the night deepened and the soft dew fell like a benediction a fairy form floated over the sweetest of blossoms then disappeared and all was dark and silent save a gentle flutter as of wings but in the morning when the sunbeams had awakened the sleeping blossoms a flight of bright-winged butterflies floated in the air or lighted for a moment on the flowers but the sweet peas had all disappeared and were nowhere to be seen fanny wright dixon end of section eighteen this recording is in the public domain section nineteen of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred one recorded for librivox dot org by betty b rabbit's cream every one is well acquainted with the arts of frosty jack with his etchings on the windows with the tints that mark his track but the quaint and merry artist has a fancy of his own that is delicate and graceful but is not so widely known when no green is in the forest and no bloom is in the dell not a flower star to twinkle not the smallest blossom bell here and there an herb he singles brown and dry and round its stem fastens with his magic fingers one great silver shining gem shell-like delicate and dainty white and lucent as a pearl just as though he took a fragment of the mist and with a twirl froze it into shape and substance such a fine and fragile thing that the fairy queen might crush it if she brushed it with her wing then he steals away delighted he has planned a morning treat for a troop who soon will flutter through the wood on dancing feet all the little country urchins love to see its silver gleam love to fancy it a dainty and they call it rabbit's cream hattie whitney end of section nineteen this recording is in the public domain section twenty of birds and nature volume nine number one january nineteen hundred one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b the apple both pagan and christian mythologies have endowed the apple with wonderful virtues it has possessed a symbolism for man in all stages of civilization standing for the type of the earthly in its contrast with the spiritual it represented the idea of that conflict between ormuzd and Arimanes, in which the evil principle is continually victor the stories of eve of paris the hesperides and atalanta all emphasize this thought showing the apple to have been a reward of appetite over conscience the allegorical tree of knowledge bore apples guarded by the serpent and the golden fruit of the garden of hesperides was apples protected by the sleepless dragon which it was one of the triumphs of hercules to slay the assyrian tree gav karenna the persian jima's paradise indra's heaven and the scandinavian ash tree yggdrasil all prefaced the story of paris and the apple of discord which ate brought to the banquet of the gods in greece it became the emblem of love being dedicated to venus 
aphrodite bore it in her hand as well as eve and it is said that ulysses longed for it in the garden of alcinus while tantalus vainly grasped it for it in hades the fruit was offered as a prize in the grecian games given in honor of apollo among the heathen gods of the north there were apples fabled to possess the power of conferring immortality which were carefully watched over by the goddess iduna and jealously preserved for the desert of the gods who experienced the enervation of old age azrael accomplished his mission by holding the apple to the nostrils of his victim and the scandinavian genii are said to have possessed the power of turning the fruit into gold the ancients better appreciated the importance of the apple than do the moderns who treat it chiefly as the embryonic condition of cider or as something to be metamorphosed into pies it is said to be indigenous to every part of the inhabited globe except south america and the islands of the pacific it is equally at home in the fierce heat of the equator and among the frosts of siberia in olden times the fig was the index of a native civilization later on the vine was king but at the present time there are many who maintain that the apple is the only genuine index of civilized man and claim that it flourishes best in those regions where man's moral and intellectual supremacy is most marked the athenians made frequent mention of the cultivation of the apple and pliny enumerates twenty varieties that were known in his day it is generally supposed that the goths and vandals introduced the manufacture and use of cider into the mediterranean provinces and references to it are made by tertullian and the african fathers the use of cider can be traced from africa into the biscayan provinces of spain and thence to normandy it is supposed to have come into england at the time of the conquest but the word cider is said to be anglo-saxon and there is reason to believe that it was known in the island as early as the time of hengist as the mistletoe grew chiefly on the apple and the oak the former was regarded with great respect by the ancient druids of britain and even to this day in some parts of england the antique custom of saluting the apple trees in the orchards in the hope of obtaining a good crop the next year still lingers among the farmers of devonshire and herefordshire during the middle ages the fruit was made the pretext for massacring the oppressed tribes of israel as it was supposed that the hebrews used apples to entice children into their homes to furnish their cannibal banquets the different varieties of apples have all descended from a species of crab found wild in most parts of europe although there are two or three species of wild crab belonging to this country yet none of our cultivated varieties have been raised from them but rather from seeds of the species brought here by the colonists from europe over two hundred varieties of apples are known at the present time as a rule the apple is a hardy slow-growing tree with an irregular head rigid branches roughish bark and a close-grained wood it thrives best in limestone soils and deep loams it will not flourish in wet soils or on those of a peaty or sandy character as a rule the trees live to be fifty or eighty years of age but there are specimens now bearing fruit in this country that are known to be over two hundred years old the wood is often stained black and used as ebony it is also made into shoe lasts cog wheels and small articles of furniture and is greatly prized in italy for wood carving and statuary new and choice varieties of apples are derived from seeds planted to produce stocks one stock in ten thousand may prove better than the original and its virtues are perpetuated by layers cuttings graftings and budding the tree is not subject to disease insects notably the borer the woolly aphis the caterpillar the apple moth and the bark louse have to be guarded against and several blights occasionally attack the foliage but as a rule small loss is experienced from these sources charles s radden End of section 20
Section 21 of Birds and Nature, Volume 9, Number 1, January 1901. Recorded for LibriVox.org by Tavarish. Shed no tear, oh, shed no tear, the flower will bloom another year. Weep no more, oh, weep no more, young buds sleep in the root's white core. Dry your eyes, oh, dry your eyes, for I was taught in paradise to ease my breast of melodies. Shed no tear. Overhead, look overhead, among the blossoms white and red. Look up, look up, I flutter now on this flush pomegranate bough. See me, tis this silvery bill ever cures the good man's ill shed no tear oh shed no tear the flower will bloom another year adieu adieu i fly adieu i vanish in the heavens blue adieu adieu john keats end of section twenty one this recording is in the public domain